Uh, my name is Chris Dreyer. I'm uh, the CEO of CFA System, and I'm very happy to have you here uh, for this uh, first session that we're actually conducting as a video conference uh, with uh, contributions uh, from uh, London to Stockholm and San Francisco. Uh, so we have uh, speakers uh, from these new locations. Uh, we're going to talk about blockchain and the Ethereum uh, way of working with blockchain or developing blockchain and how this will develop uh, or could develop, I would say, uh, in the clearing and trading and settlement space, uh, pretty much disrupted as well. And that's at least the potential that uh, this promises. Uh, we have two presentations of about 15 to 20 minutes uh, each, uh, and there's a group uh, QA session after the second. So please uh, keep your questions on the then. Uh, for the questions, as uh, I'll be looking at, uh, we can walk around with the iPad, which actually is the one window. Move the iPad around a little bit. Yep, the one window to the left and right. And then walk around uh, again and send it uh, uh, to the speakers. Uh, so with that, uh, let's try and get started. Ken, can you just start off here? Uh, sure. Uh, is there any way for me to uh, see who's in the room? Oh, uh, actually, yes, I think. Sabine, could you actually... Uh, yeah, he's seeing you now. <laughs> Great. I'm getting a, a lot of feedback from the, um, I think, from the iPad. It's, it's muted now. It should be. Um, OK, that's fine. Great. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ken Kapler. Um, I'm the Technical Communications Director. Um, please uh, let me know if there's any problems with the uh, presentation, um, and I will attempt to repeat myself. Um, I'm just going to do a quick presentation today. Um, on Ethereum and on blockchain, specifically trying to uh, explain blockchain technology in terms that um, people with a financial background can understand and hopefully uh, demystify a bit of uh, a bit of the uh, uh, information surrounding it. So. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about some of the, uh, the potential disruption that blockchain technology might cause for the financial sector, um, some of the, uh, the applications it might have, um, and also talk about some of, the, some of the things that people are working on. Uh, once I'm finished, I think uh, a, um, you're going to have a nice presentation from Patrick Salami, who will be talking about one of the applications he's building on top of Ethereum platform. So um, I'm just going to quickly go over the basics um, and try and explain what is blockchain technology in a way that um, doesn't require too much technical understanding. Um, so it's a very new technology. It's only about six years old. Um, it's currently centered around cryptocurrency. Um, it uses peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, which, is, uh, which are literally networks where every member is considered to be an equal. Um, there are no admin servers or clients. Uh, people just connect to the network uh, via other other people, and they can drop off anytime they want. People join, leave, etc. And there is never there is no central control of it. Um, I won't get into too too much technical detail, but this is basically a decentralized system. And what that means is that it operates without any central decision making or central authority. Now, currently, we rely very heavily on central databases for everything we do, especially in the world of finance. Um, our banks maintain lists of accounts, our governments maintain property registers, our CSDs keep track of our securities. Um, these third parties, we, we place this trust in them to maintain stores of information for us um, because we can't trust ourselves to keep accurate records and we certainly can't trust other people. So we we do this because we want to, we want to have a source of information which is basically uh, a reliable place for us to uh, deal with other people. Um, 
Now, why do we do this? Uh, why in the age of computers, where we should presumably be able to make uh, to, to have really good and high quality um, record keeping, um, do we need to rely on, say, a third party to uh, to store information for us? Well, um, here's a good example of a centralized system. This is a Google Sheet. Um, on this Google Sheet, uh, you're allowed to invite other people to edit in real time the same sheet as you do. Um, so now you can invite Alice and Bob, and they can come along, and they can update uh, cells and information on the spreadsheet. Um, but the question is, how does it settle arguments? And what I mean by that is, how does it, uh, how does it deal with the fact that Alice and Bob most, might want to, say, amend information in one cell at the same time? And the answer is, is that essentially Google makes the decision for them. Google will decide if Alice or Bob are correct. Um, and that is a, kind of a problem, because that means we have to trust Google to make honest decisions. Um, they might collude with Alice or Bob, if this is an important document, to just allow their, their alterations to end up being the final ones. Um, this can be understood as being the, the same reason why we need to have third parties to keep track of who owns what. Um, if we ask all banks just to keep track of their own transactions, and then every other bank keeps, keeps track of their own balances, etc., um, and then we try to reconcile sell them with each other, um, this system would break down almost immediately. This is also why we couldn't use a peer-to-peer -peer network to do this. So we couldn't we wouldn't be able to agree on the truth of a current state of a database like a Google Sheepdog, because each peer would be updating it, making changes, and they would never be able to come into consensus about the truth. The reason we can't just trust a computer to do this, why we can't just set up a server somewhere and allow it to be a, a trusted third party for record keeping, is because you have to trust whoever owns the computer, who has access to it. It has a physical location in the world. And this has been true pretty much since the day, the, since we started uh, uh, the process of um, dematerializing assets back in the 1980s and 90s. Now, around six years ago, um, an anonymous person or persons invented a new and uh, fascinating game that involved the maintenance of a shared database across a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, the players of this game collected points by maintaining the database and preventing others from making invalid changes. Um, the database only had one purpose. It was used to keep track of the number of points accrued by users taking part in the game. This game was called Bitcoin. And the points I mentioned are that what the players earned was were the first cryptocurrency. Now, while the motives of the inventors seem obvious, they wish to create a currency outside of any central control. Uh, the technology that was developed in order to create that decentralized currency had far more potential than had been realized at the time. What had been invented was the ability to maintain a ledger across a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, this is a network where uh, all members are equal participants. Um, and you can securely process changes to that ledger in almost real time. Now, this is without a central authority, without a central location, without any need to trust other members of the network. There's no, there's no infrastructure, there's nobody in charge, uh, and they call these technologies blockchains and cryptocurrency. So how do we define Bitcoin? Um, as a ledger, I think a few people do that, a, a currency, a distributed database? Well, not really. It needs to be defined as three things. Number one is the network, this peer-to-peer -peer network that maintains this database. Secondly, it's a currency. Uh, and most importantly, it's a service. It acts as a service to its users, that service being the, updating, the up, update of this ledger when you send transactions to it. So Bitcoin Network provides a service of trustless transaction processing. Now, I'd like to include this slide just because it's uh, helpful to, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so, a blockchain um, is a special database type designed specifically to be decentralized. Um, very specifically, it's discreetly updated, it can only be partially changed, uh, and is only valid if strict rules regarding changes made to it have been obeyed. Most importantly, it retains all the information that's ever sent to it. Now, a decentralized consensus network this is a network of peers that maintain a blockchain database. When I say maintain, what I mean is they validate changes made to the blockchain in an attempt to propagate one valid version of the, this database. 
uh, consensus mechanism. This is uh, how we incentivize a peer-to-peer -peer network to become a decentralized consensus network. Now, this is uh, called mining in Bitcoin, uh, validation in other systems. Sometimes it's called authorization or, uh, or validation. Um, now, cryptocurrency, uh, this is just information stored on the blockchain. It's just one type of service that can be offered by a decentralized consensus network. Um, when you transfer coins from one person to another, what you're really doing is, is changing an entry in a ledger, just like a bookkeeper in a bank would do. Um, so what is Ethereum? Well, so far the uses of blockchain have so far centered on maintaining ledgers, usually ledgers that contain cryptocurrency. Um, the reason for this is that was what Bitcoin was designed to do, and that was the first application that was built on top of a blockchain. Um, Ethereum has built a blockchain where you have kind of this flexibility to define the kind of service you want the network to offer. Um, programmable smart contracts run on top of the Ethereum blockchain mean you can define uh, any kind of service you want. Uh, what a smart contract is is uh, it's not necessarily a legal contract, but what it is is it's a code protocol that uh, facilitates or enforces elements of a real-world contract, but only as it pertains to information stored on a blockchain. So what does this mean for financial services? Well, so far we've seen attempts to replace centrally issued currency, and these have been semi-successful. Bitcoin's fairly well known. There's a few other options out there. Um, there's some investigation into whether or not it's useful as a kind of a remittance platform or a money transfer platform. But what is coming will be attempts to replace certain key financial services in which intelligent decision making is not required. Um, essentially trying to remove the need for intermediaries, um, both for exchange and the registry of ownership. So what am I talking about here? Well, essentially these are services in the financial service industry which usually offer pretty poor value. Um, I'm talking about custody banks, interbank settlement, registrar, registrar's clearing, places where essentially we just need to trust them to keep good records and to behave honestly. Um, we can define these services as smart contracts, deploy them to a network like Ethereum, and then at this point the network will offer these services in just the same way that the Bitcoin network offers the service of processing of Bitcoin transactions. Um, the creative part of finance is left untouched. So there, there's going to be plenty of work left over um, to keep up, maintain kind of a... Sorry guys, did I lose you there? Oh, okay, sorry, I thought I lost you there. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, I was saying, um, so yes, the, this is, uh, blockchains have the potential for uh, replacing certain services in the financial sector. Um, I've mentioned custody, interbank settlement, and registrars and clearing. Um, but it, it leaves the creative part of finance a different touch. So designing financial products becomes you know, a lot easier using uh, these kind of systems because you no longer need to uh, find a third party willing to uh, store and enable you to tr trade these systems. Um, as well as all, obviously the intelligence required to uh, manage risk and handle client business and make correct investments. Um, Ethereum is flexible enough to facilitate the fulfillment of contractual agreements like um, financial products, securities, bonds, debt, etc. Um, we spoke to pretty much every major financial institution, and almost every single one is investigating this technology as a potential replacement for these third-party services. Um, so how will this affect accountancy and risk? Well, blockchains are a pretty robust system. Um, a blockchain won't operate if all changes made to them are not retained. So if you try to hide a, hide a change to it, then blockchain will decide it's invalid and will no longer allow itself to be updated and anybody who, can, who examines that blockchain will see that's the case. Um, a blockchain won't allow changes to be made without digitally signed transactions. Um, blockchains can't have their history altered without again invalidating the whole database. And blockchains have been designed specifically 
um, to operate in the, in the wild west of the internet where there's no administration and no manual override. This makes them extremely robust. Um, and what else does it do? Well, it's not just about replacing current third-party systems. It also basically opens up the uh, opens up the opportunities for people to build uh, uh, new experiments in the financial sector. Um, creating financial products is hard, but it becomes almost trivial using these kind of technologies. Um, barriers to entry exist in developing new financial products. One of the ones that we're, we're looking at at the moment is crowdfunding equity. This is uh, taking off in the UK in a very big way and also in the US. Um, but what they do is they will issue equity, but it isn't fungible. You can't dispose of it unless you find somebody else who also took part in the uh, crowdfund to sell your shares to. Now, it's quite possible in the future these kind of, uh, these kind of organizations could offer shares that were tradable on the blockchain and would have therefore have much a higher value to investors. Um, so for better or worse, this is, this is coming and it's, it's likely to create a more inclusive system and a broader system for investment. Um, fundamental to blockchain technology is the transparency. On the public networks on the internet, everybody can see every transaction that's ever been processed. So public blockchains can be audited in real time by anybody. This allows you to keep track of, the, of what's going on in, in real time across the world and it can potentially improve regulation and risk, and also especially systemic risk of the financial systems. Private blockchains, on the other hand, while uh, not as transparent, provide unforgeable audit trails. I mentioned how blockchain technology makes it almost impossible to modify blockchains uh, past, so change their history. Everything has to be included, and if you remove information from it, the blockchain becomes obviously uh, invalid to anybody examining it. Um, this would be especially useful for uh, uh, ensuring that there's no malfeasance in the back office of banks um, because it makes it impossible for people to change things without having large-scale collusion within the organization. So what is Ethereum? Well, um, Ethereum is currently a public network of computers running a general-purpose blockchain. Um, it's open source. Uh, the network isn't owned by anyone, and you can download our, our code from GitHub and use it any way you see fit within any organization you wish to build something on. Um, specifically, it's been designed as a platform for building services for these decentralized consensus networks to provide. Um, it's highly flexible, and it's limited only by the imagination of the developer. If you can code it up in a, in a smart contract, then you can deploy that smart contract to the network, and you suddenly have this service provider of basically completely trustworthy. Um, it's a neutral platform. So it's any kind of service you imagine could build. It's not necessarily just for fintech. It has applications in the internet, uh, in commerce, and in the consumer level. Um, I think. Right now, we're not going to do questions, but uh, Patrick is going to talk about one of the applications he's building on top of Ethereum, uh, and we will hopefully come back and return to uh, answer any of your questions afterwards. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. Uh, I think that was a very good overview of uh, what Ethereum is and what it does. And by the way, Ethereum is based in Zug, Switzerland. Uh, so that's the uh, the foundation of uh, the crypto valley as well. Uh, that uh, uh, that is that is at play here. Um, so now we're uh, moving over to Patrick Salami, who's uh, joining us uh, from San Francisco. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, a solution that uh, Hitfin is proposing to do uh, for clearing based on uh, the Ethereum protocol, just as an instance of uh, how this technology uh, in general could be applied to a special application. Patrick. Great. <coughs> Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ken, for uh, setting up uh, the background of, of Ethereum. Uh, can you guys hear me okay, and can you see me as well? Very good. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Chris mentioned, um, my, um, my company, Hitfin, is currently working on a, um, a clearing and settlement platform uh, that is based on, on Ethereum, and we are, uh, you know, exploring... Um, use cases uh, that relate to um, the, the clearing and settlement of, of derivatives contracts 
specifically uh, right now we're working on forwards, um, and um, we will also work on, on options as well. And so we've identified uh, Ethereum as a uh, great uh, platform to, to build those types of contracts. And um, what I'll do is I'll start with kind of um, a, a presentation uh, that, that goes into, into some more details. I'll share my screen. Um, can, you, can you guys see the presentation? Great. Then uh, let's uh, let's get started. So, um, so th as um, as Ken mentioned, uh, we use the Ethereum blockchain, uh, which which uses the uh, you know a similar technology that that underlies Bitco the Bitcoin protocol, uh, but has a lot of enhancements. Uh, in particular, it allows you to deploy code to the blockchain that can then be executed um, in a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. And what that allows us to do, it, is, it allows us to encode a, um, it allows us to encode the, the terms of a financial transaction. So, for example, um, you know, with with Bitcoin, uh, we were able to say, you know, we'd like to transfer funds from uh, one uh, account to another, or from one wallet to another wallet. Right, and that made it that made Bitcoin suitable uh, for uh, you know certain applications in 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 payments. Uh, but what we've identified with Ethereum is that the the transaction can be much more complicated than that. It does not have to be uh, a payment remittance, for example. It can be an options contract or a futures contract or a forward contract. And so, um, when it's a forward contract, the only thing that that um, really needs to happen. Uh, from the outside is that uh, a price feed has to be available to the uh, Ethereum blockchain. And what we will then do is we will encode the terms of the contract between the two counterparties uh, into, into the Ethereum blockchain, and based on the price feed, that code will then figure out how much each party owes to the other, and will then make the necessary debits and credits. And um, I'll show, in, in, in a few minutes, I'll show a little bit how that, how that works uh, in, in real life. Uh, the the problem that we're trying to address, and uh, many of you in the audience may be familiar with uh, some of these issues that we'll discuss, uh, is that uh, the existing system is quite complex when it comes to, to clearing and settlement and and trading uh, of financial instruments. And so, uh, in many cases, um, you know, it's required to go through multiple intermediaries. Uh, especially if you're not one of the bigger players, you often have to go to a clearing broker, who then has to go. For example, to a clearing house, uh, or has to clear the trade for the the customer, and so um, these intermediaries add a lot of complexity and time uh, required to clear a trade, and incre also increases the costs. And so, uh, in today's system, for example, um, you know Ken mentioned um, equities. For example, uh, take several days still to settle here in the United States, at least. Uh, derivatives are a little bit faster, but nonetheless, in order to transfer funds between two counterparties, uh, you still have to wait for uh, those uh, th those funds to to travel through the traditional channels. And so, when you, for example, when you exchange margin between two counterparties, uh, that's typically done once or twice a day. Uh, whereas on the blockchain, we can do that whenever a new block is mined, and so we can exchange margin between counterparties basically in real time. Uh, for example, every 15 seconds. And so here in this um, illustration, we can kind of see the, uh, uh, the, the current state of the world and how um, financial transactions are, um, are clear today through broker-dealers, exchanges, and so on. And so what we've done, essentially, is we've created what um, is often referred to as smart contracts. Now, the term smart contracts, um, you know, it's, it's you know, kind of new, and um, you know, a lot of people have different definitions of what, what a smart contract is. Uh, for, for us, um, the way we understand that term is that we have a contract that enforces its own terms. So where in the traditional system you have, for example, a forwards contract or an options contract, that contract exists on paper, um, but the, the terms of that contract are enforced by the counterparties or by a trusted intermediary uh, if the counterparties, for example, don't know each other or don't trust each other. And so 
um, you know, we've identified here on the Ethereum blockchain that we can uh, execute smart contracts, and um, we can transfer <clears throat> uh, the the assets that are um, that the contract uh, pertains to uh, through through the same peer-to-peer -peer network, and so this allows the um, the, the self-enforcing nature of of the smart contract. And so, uh, as I mentioned, what we will do is we we encode the terms of the financial instrument that exists already into the blockchain. So we're not creating new financial products. Uh, we're taking existing financial products and we're taking existing financial contracts. And as a matter of fact, the way our platform works, those contracts have already been pre-agreed upon between the counterparties. Uh, so we don't do any order matching at the moment uh, or order execution. Uh, instead, when the counterparties come on our platform, they've already agreed on the terms they simply enter the terms into the system. Our system then creates this this um, Ethereum code uh, and um, encodes the conditions of the contract into the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, the contracts are self-executing. And what that means is, that, is essentially that the smart contracts can control um, other ledgers that exist on the Ethereum blockchain. And so unlike Bitcoin, where you have kind of one ledger and one asset natively, uh, on Ethereum, you can, you know, be, because of these, this, um, this code that you can deploy to, to the blockchain, you can create many different assets. So, for example, you know, you can create a, um, a, a currency or an asset that represents U.S. dollars, or you can create an asset, for example, that, it, that, that represents other collateral, like, like treasury notes, for example, and so on. And so what that allows us to do is it, it allows us to have these derivative contracts that can move those assets between the counterparties based on... The, the conditions of the contract and based on the uh, um, the, the underlying asset values, um, and so what uh, you know in in order to facilitate this, you know there there are certain um, parties involved. So for example, uh, you know to actually move the asset onto the Ethereum blockchain, um, a custodian could be involved. For example. Uh, who uh, who holds the um, the asset off chain in custody and then just represents the asset on on chain, uh, and there's various different models that, you know how how this can be done and you know that's a little bit out of, out of scope of this presentation but um, if you're interested in learning more you know uh, please feel free to reach out um, and uh, also uh, in in case there's a, a a problem with the smart contract. As I mentioned earlier, the, the obligation between the counterparties exists separately from Ethereum and separately from the smart contract. And so, uh, if if there's a you know a mistake, for example, that 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 occurs, or you know if there's an error in the in you know in, in the contract code, we you know we, we get this question a lot. Or for example, if there's a problem with the price feed, what happens? It's true that the assets that get transferred on the Ethereum blockchain, you know. Would would be moved in, incorrectly if there's a problem with the price feed, uh, but what happens then is that the counterparties, you know, at least one of the counter, counterparties needs to recognize that the problem happened, and then needs to settle with that counterparty to um, to make sure that they're even and uh, make sure that they're square. Uh, of of course, if one counterparty fails to meet their obligation, just as if you know it happened without blockchain, you know, um, the the other side may have to go to court, right? Uh, so that's something that can happen, but that can happen also without Ethereum. That that can happen today, um, you know. And that's kind of the the argument we put forth in support of this. Is you know we say that uh, in fact we we know that in today's derivatives trading world, uh, disputes arise you know qu quite often. So counterparties could argue over um, uh, which price feed should be used, or you know if if there's if there's some problem with the price feed, uh, how how that should be handled. And we think the um, uh, the the uh, um, occurrence of, of disputes would be reduced significantly uh, in um, you know when 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 you use a platform like like Ethereum because the 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 terms are um, you know encoded on the blockchain and, and you, you cannot change the the logic that executes once it's deployed both counterpart both counterparties agree um, the blockchain will execute this code and will determine how much each side owes you know every 15 seconds and you 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 don't change the those this this logic the the only thing the only externality is the price feed typically uh, or or sometimes more than one right price feeds um, 
and so yes, of course, there could be a problem with the price feed, but that that can happen today all the same. I mean, if you have a derivatives contract that you that you're settling over the counter, um, you are um, you know, you, and and there's a problem with your price feed. If it's been manipulated or it's unavailable, um, you know, you're going to have some issues. So, but we think here that, that you know, because the um, the the logic is encoded on the blockchain, um, the the amount of disputes will be far reduced. Um, lastly, uh, b before we kind of go into a demo, um, the the process kind of looks like this. This is uh, again, this is for over-the-counter derivatives trades. So this is not for exchange-traded instruments, but this is what you know when when two parties enter into a in, into a financial agreement uh, without any uh, exchange. And so typically, they would have to go through, as I mentioned, a broker or perhaps a clearinghouse uh, for centrally clear instruments, um, uh, but uh, for over-the-counter trades that are not centrally cleared, uh, you know, here the two counterparties can enter into this agreement bilaterally without having to trust each other, without ha without requiring a high degree of trust, and without exposing the counterparties to significant co to, to significant counterparty credit risk. And we'll show in, you know in a moment how that how and why that works. Um, so uh, the way the process works is that you know the um, uh, the counterparties post the the terms of the of the contract they've agreed upon um, to the blockchain. Uh, the uh, both counterparties affirm terms, uh, and uh, what then happens is collateral that's represented on the blockchain is locked, uh, and it's locked in the accounts of the uh, of, of the counterparty. So the, the collateral doesn't actually move. It's just it still belongs to uh, uh, the the margin provider. But uh, so whichever counterparty put up the collateral, but uh, it, it's it's just um, you know the the contracts that control the collateral are instructed to not allow the collateral to be withdrawn um, while the contract is open, and then what happens is at the end the contract settles. Um, and so uh, I'll go into a, a quick a quick demo here. Um, let's see. Okay, it looks it looks like you can still see my my screen. Great. So, um, so yeah. So we'll go through this real quick. So uh, essentially, we have two traders here. Um, we have Alice and Bob. Um, Alice and left Bob on the right. And what happens is Alice is now entering uh, a new forward contract and um, 100 million shares of um, Euro USD uh, as as the notional amount. And the the tenor here we've set to a very short 300 seconds, which is artificially uh, low. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, this is only actually done for for demonstration purposes um, to to demonstrate the um, uh, the flexibility kind of of the system. So in today's world, you know, it's very difficult to have uh, you know um, co contracts with non-standard tenors, for example. Right? Like, what, what if I wanted something that's only open for twelve hours or um, an hour, for example, or something like that? Right? Uh, th that's maybe not the primary use case. Typically, you would still have here a longer tenor. Um, but kind of, again, just kind of for demonstration purposes. So you know, we name the we we name the contract. We we put in the underlying um, underlying case. This is a Euro USD forex contract, and we specify the price feed. It's actually the how the contract will be settled. It will be settled based on the spot price of uh, Euro USD at the ideal pro exchange, uh, 300 seconds from the trade date. Um, the the contractor price is the price that. Um, the um, the long will pay to the short uh, upon co upon contract expiration, and this here would be typically the forward price. Now, in the case of this, you know, this 300 second tenor, those are you know typically the same. Uh, but you would then compare you would compute the forward price, um, uh, and you know what whatever the the you know pre agreed uh, price will be between the counterparties, right? It doesn't have to be the um, you know perfect forward price. It can just be. Uh, you know, it, it it can be um it can be cheap, for example, right? And so uh, then here, um, what we enter is the um the initial margin that's required from both counterparties in basis points. Now, um, again, this is kind of a little bit simplified for for demonstration purposes, but um, other options here include uh, in you know providing the initial margin, um, you know, and, and providing just an absolute number um, instead of instead of basis points. And so we can see here that based on the calculation, there's one point uh, one million dollars. Required an initial margin uh, from by by the way from both sides in this in this uh, in in this in this example 
Um, but uh, you know, no, normally um, you would you would maybe have different amounts of margin, uh, you know, for each counterparty. And and by, by the way, the, there's a lot of complexity around um, ca computing this amount. So, for example, if there's many trades that are open between the two counterparties, you can use a margin, an initial margin model. And there's third-party vendors that provide these models to compute how much initial margin is required between you know for for each side, based on their other trades they have with that counterparty. Um, you know, this is often also referred to as trade compression. So we can lower the amount of initial margin required if we have multiple offsetting trades um, between counterparties. And and also it depends on the credit risk or perceived credit risk of. So the, you know, if it's a sovereign, maybe they might pay. Um, they might they might have paid a little bit less. Um, but now with with central clearing, um, you know, the um, the regulator. Uh, you know, specifies the initial margin, um, and so maybe everybody has to pay the same amount. Um, great. So, uh, so we'll we'll kind of move move along here. Um, so the the, uh, the the contract just got created on the blockchain, and what happens here on the right side now is that uh, the um, uh, the the other side, which will be the short, is um, presented with the terms of the contract and uh, is asked to affirm. And so what happens is once they affirm the um, uh, you know, each side is kind of you know their their side of the contract, and and the margin hold is placed on their account. We can see here minus one point one million dollars uh, on the side. And so we'll kind of see how that plays out. So here, um, what's happening here now is that the contract is open. Um, as we can see, your status open. We can see the um, the the trade dates. We can see the maturity date, um, and uh, we can see who has a long, who has a short. Uh, you know, we see the email addresses here, but, uh, but you know, often you can also trade with just the, with just the blockchain address alone. So you don't even have to know the email address of the counterparties. And so what we can see here, and this is kind of the interesting part, is that um, between the counterparties now, we're exchanging variation margin. And so this is typically something that happens only once a day. But as you can see here, you know, um, twenty thousand dollars, which is debit from Bob, credited to Alice. Um, I'm sorry, the other way around. And so uh, this, um, you know, this exchange of variation margin is taking place in real time. And that's kind of like the um, innovative step here, we feel, and it's something that you cannot do in today's system. Again, here's minus 20K on the left, plus 20K on the right. Down below, we can see kind of the ledger uh, of recent transactions. Uh, here, we can see the amount um, of margin that's on hold. Um, and we can also see, again, um, you know, in real time, the, um, the, the margin that's exchanged between the counterparties. And so again, so this kind of continues um, on while the contract is open. Again, we're kind of this is you know um, a little bit edited here, so for for expediency. And so um, you know, right here in a few seconds, we're actually going to fast forward to the end of the contract to show you what happens when it settles. Uh, when it settles, you know, it, all, all that happens really is that variation margin is exchanged one last time between the counterparties, and we can see here that the final P and L was plus ten thousand dollars on the right, minus ten thousand dollars on the left, um, and that's that's pretty much. Um, you know that's pretty much the uh, the uh, the the whole trade that that we showed you. Um, you know, kind of compressed down. Uh, again, typically these trades would be open for much longer. But uh, again, so our hope here is that um, we uh, we we can lower the risk, uh, the the counterparty credit risk, by exchanging variation margin between the two counterparties in real time. They may not know each other that well. They may not know each other's credit worthiness that well. Um, we think that this allows other, you know, new players to trade who previously were not able to trade because maybe they weren't big enough, didn't have the relationships with the, um, uh, with with the, with the prime brokers, for example, or uh, you know, didn't have the established credit rating to be able to make, you know, enter into those trades, and so um, so we feel that this has a lot of interesting applications. Uh, again, um, uh, the, that's that's my time. So um, you know, I, I think we'll we'll move into Q and A. If you uh, would like to learn more about about this, feel free to uh, reach out. Um, you know, our website is www.hitfin.com. And my name is my name is Patrick. That's great. Thanks very thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, now I'm opening for uh, two questions. Uh, Sabine is going to walk around with the iPad, and uh, you can just basically ask your question. I'm turning down your volume for the moment uh, to avoid the feedback. You can open. Hi. Uh, my name is Alvish. One thing I want to ask you 
Okay, now the line's open again. Who wants to take this? Um, I can take this. Yeah, so, um, yeah, no, the, the, it is impossible for somebody to debit your account um, unless you've, uh, you've agreed to it. So the, essentially, you will need to sign a transaction with your private key to say, I agree to this. When we say that um, you, can, you, can have, um, you can have automatic debits using smart contracts, what we were actually talking about is that you've already consented to enter into that process. Um, so you've already entered into a contractual agreement where you say, I'm going to allow this smart contract to make a decision on whether or not this I get debited or not. So Patrick's example uh, of kind of derivative settlement, um, this could be other things. It could be, for example, you would uh, you send a transaction to the network saying, oh, I've been set up for to be billed by this smart contract for my, my internet access for the month. Um, but it's all voluntary. There is no, the, the, the network is a, can't just, just decide to take your money. Um, you actually have to uh, permit it to do so. Okay, second question. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, very nice presentation. My name is Gabriel uh, Silva. Uh, sorry? Are you, is the line open? No. Uh, yes? No? <coughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Can <laughs> you see me? No. Five minutes, okay. Uh, my name is Gabriel Silva. Uh, just wanted to wish uh, to thank you for this uh, very enlightening presentation. I have a number of questions, but I will just, one. just a couple of, of one of which are embedded by my own. First of all, uh, for the system to work, you need to have a distributed system where people validate trades. And then, I mean, the transparency of the data, because they put transparency of the data. Based on that, we on everyone that does the system, a problem of size of this database and plus efficiency of the database itself. And so uh, I am coming to the irreversibility of trades and maybe what uh, Fisher was saying before. Uh, how fat fingers can be handled in this system? OK. Um, yeah, so the first part was regarding uh, the efficiency. Uh, sorry, you, need to, you need to start again, because I had to open the line. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah. The, um, the first part, which was about efficiency and scalability, these are, these are real issues with blockchain technology. Um, what this gentleman was talking about, and I'm sorry I missed your name, is the, the fundamental uh, requirement of the network that everybody involved, in every single peer, every single node, has to process every transaction and keep a complete database, uh, blockchain database, of everything that's ever happened on the network. This is obviously a, uh, leads to scalability issues, but there are things we are working on. Um, there is potential for this to uh, have scoping so that you don't necessarily have to keep every transaction on your local node and that different nodes can hold different transactions based on uh, you know, what area of the world they're in or perhaps it, there'll be one chain for uh, securities and one chain for uh, cash. Um, the second part, which was uh, regarding reversibility, well, the, 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 that is very true of Bitcoin transactions. Um, on Ethereum, because you define your, um, you can define uh, your own services using smart contracts. You can you can add the functionality of say credit card chargebacks or some other kind of reversibility functionality into any asset you want to list on the on the blockchain, be it um, cash as uh, Patrick's doing in his project, or um, you know uh, if it was equity or debt. 
the flexibility is there to define uh, reversibility however way you want it to be. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, so maybe I, if, I, if I may follow up quickly. Um, for for those two questions, um, the, the, you know, I, as as I mentioned earlier during the presentation, also th this is definitely a valid concern uh, that something could go wrong, right? Um, but there's two things that what I'd like to point out. One is that um, the making these transfers uh, is is you know typically available to you at least um, you know in, in bytecode form, and so before you enter into some kind of contract or before you know you have money that's 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 yours that's at, that's at, that's at stake. <laughs> Uh, you will typically have an opportunity to know what type of contract is going to be handling your funds, and so you know you would typically work with a company or a software developer uh, that you trust, and they would pre provide the software. And so your counterparties will have to trust that same software developer, or maybe the software is developed by one of the counterparties, right? And so uh, built and and deployed, uh, it you know it's typically not changed. You know, and if it were changed, you know, everybody kind of would know because you, you, everybody has access to the same blockchain, everybody has access to the same code. So you know, you have complete assurance that the code that that's running, that's handling your money, is in fact the code that you know that that you think it is. And if you're not a developer, you know, there's um, there's companies like ours, or you know, there's many other companies that are building on Ethereum and other blockchains that that are actually writing the code for you. And as long as you trust them. You know that you know your money is, is is handled in a certain way. Just just like today, when you trust the bank with the money, you um you know that it's handled in a certain way. Um, there's also the aspect of reversibility. You know, of course, even if you trust your developer, you know they, they it's possible that there's a bug in the code, or as I mentioned, there could be an external price feed that uh that uh, that is invalid or has some problem, and that's out of the control of your developer, out of your control. You know, it's just an external price feed that's coming from. Uh, some external source that you've pre-agreed upon, and th if there's a problem, then your contract will not execute the way it was supposed to. And in that case, y you will have to settle the obligation with your counterparties. And uh, at least in our model, you know, the models that we're mostly exploring are models where the counterparties n at least know, maybe, maybe they don't know each other's names, but they know of each other, or they have some way of interacting with each other, either through a broker or uh, th through some other communication channel. And so. Um, but you know, I, I think that in a lot of use cases, just like today, the counterparties actually do know who the other is, and in that case, you know, th this should be not that big of an issue. If there's a small mistake that that occurs, you just call up your counterparty, and be like, oh, okay, I, I owe you an extra, you know, whatever, ten thousand dollars or whatever, right? So, um, you know, of course, there could be extreme situations where, you know, a very large sum is transferred and something goes wrong. Okay, very good. Well. Ken, Patrick, thank you very much. That's been very uh, interesting and very uh, insightful presentations uh, for our finance audience here. And uh, it was really great to have you here. And uh, regards uh, to San Francisco and to London. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're actually now breaking off this uh, broadcast, and uh, we're going to continue with our uh, AGM. Unfortunately, I I would like to invite you to the uh, to the upper row afterwards, but uh, that'll be a bit difficult, I'm afraid. <laughs> so thanks very much, guys.